This lecture focuses on imaging of the temporal mandibular joint. You'll notice that it's almost all MRI imaging because that's really the preferred modality for imaging the temporal mandibular joint in most circumstances, certainly in the situation where you have degenerative disease or you have facial pain of uncertain origin. Those situations require MRI, CT much less useful. So we'll start with a discussion of the appropriate MR protocol for imaging the TMJs. We'll talk about the anatomy and physiology of the temporal mandibular joint, and we'll spend a lot of time on degenerative disease of the TMJ because that is mostly what we end up imaging. And then everything else is a zebra because degenerative disease is the vast majority of what we see, uh, and we'll go through a list of other diseases. Here are the four critical MR sequences that we use when we're evaluating the temporal mandibular joint. Uh, when, with the patient's mouth closed, we do sagittal oblique T1 and T2 weighted images, as well as a coronal oblique T1 weighted image. Then we have the patient maximally open their mouth, that is as wide as is comfortable, and we put a little block in their mouth to keep it there, and then we image in with T1 weighting in the open mouth position. So what do we mean by sagittal oblique and coronal oblique? Well, what you want to do is you want to take a prescription through the ramus of the mandible and your sagittal oblique should follow the angle of the ramus of the mandible. Your coronal obliques should follow the axis of the condylar head, like so. So that's where you prescribe sagittal oblique and coronal oblique for these purposes. Notice that you can't do this all as one coronal image because the coronal oblique for the other side is not parallel to the coronal oblique for this side. Similarly, the sagittal obliques are not parallel to one another, so you need to prescribe for each side and get a series on each side. Let's talk about the normal anatomy of the joint using the sagittal oblique T1 weighted image. The condylar head and condylar neck and ramus are all visible in the center of the joint. The socket into which the condylar head fits is called the glenoid fossa. And out in front of the glenoid fossa is this mound of bone called the articular eminence. eminence. Behind that, you can see the external auditory canal. And of course, this is the temporal lobe of the brain above the glenoid fossa. Notice that you can also see this dark object right here, much darker than the other tissues in between the articular eminence and the condyle. That is the interarticular disc of the temporomandibular joint, and we're going to talk a lot about that when it comes to degenerative disease. I want to point out how smooth and round the condylar head is, and the glenoid fossa similarly smooth and rounded as a good rece receptacle for the glenoid uh, the glenoid is a good receptacle for the condylar head. It's easier to talk about the articular disc on the open mouth position, so I've reserved it for this slide. The articular disc is this dark object here and here in between the condylar head and, in this case, the articular eminence, cushioning the condylar head. The intraarticular disc has three parts. It has an anterior band, B-A-N-D, that is triangular in cross-section. There is a posterior band, also triangular in cross-section, and there is a thin part in the center, the intermediate zone, Z-O-N-E, intermediate zone that connects the anterior band to the posterior band. The size of the disc that you see here is typical of a normal disc. On T2-weighted images, a lot of the bony detail is lost, but what you see really well is whether there is any abnormal signal within the trabecula and medullary cavity of the condyle. Also, you'll see if there's any fluid in between the condyle and the glenoid fossa. A tiny little wisp of fluid is acceptable. Up to one cc in the overall joint is still considered normal. It's very difficult to assess the intraarticular disc on T2-weighted sequences.
Now let's talk about the physiology of the temporomandibular joint. When you open your jaw, there are two modes of motion. One is rotation, pivoting the jaw. The other is translation, where you shift the mandible forward. Let's talk about translation first. The translation is defined by three specific anatomic points. The first is the six o'clock position on the articular eminence. If we imagine a clock face on the articular eminence, that's gonna be six o'clock, the bottom position. The second is the 12 o'clock position on the condylar head, the very top of the condylar head. The third is the center of the intermediate zone in the middle of the disc. When we open our mouths, those three points all line up vertically. So six o'clock on the articular eminence lines up with the center of the articular disc, lines up with the top 12 o'clock on the condylar head, all in a straight line. That is normal opening of the jaw, normal translation of the jaw in open mouth position. Now, what about the other half of the equation? What about rotation? What we're judging here is the angle of the condyle before and after motion. So we draw a line along the posterior aspect of the condyle in the closed mouth position. We draw a line along the posterior aspect of the condyle in the open mouth position. And we compare the angles that angle should be different by at least 15 degrees. Here it's probably about 30 degrees. So as long as that angle changes by at least 15 degrees, that's considered normal rotation of the mandible. Let's take a moment to look at the normal position of the intraarticular disc in open and closed mouth positions. It's easier to assess an open mouth position because you can really see the anatomy of the disc itself. And we talked about its position centered in between the articular eminence and the condylar head in the normal excursion of the joint. But what about in closed mouth position? It's a little harder to see, especially the posterior band. But what you want to see in this position is you want to see the posterior band of the disc extend all the way to about 10 or 11 o'clock on the uh, circular face of the condylar head. You want the disc to come all the black signal of the disc to come all the way to here. That is considered a normal position of the disc. Let's talk for a moment about dynamic imaging, which is an optional protocol that we can use in the temporomandibular joint. We used haste or other rapid acquisition techniques, and we acquire about 15 images during slow opening of the jaw. What you can do is then animate those, and it makes for a very pretty set of images where you can actually watch the jaw open and close and watch the relationship between the intraarticular disc and the surrounding bony structures. While they do make for some attractive images, it is not clear that they actually add anything diagnostically to imaging at full open mouth and full closed mouth positions. Uh, thus, although we experimented with this, we no longer use dynamic imaging at the University of Pittsburgh. Let's turn our attention to the most common pathology to affect the temporomandibular joints, degenerative disease. We'll talk about osteophytes, about remodeling of the glenoid fossa, a late sign, effusions, marrow edema, uh, which are indications of ongoing damage, and then spend some time on disc disease, such as fissures, dislocations, and the presence or absence of disc recapture. The most common osteophyte to affect the temporomandibular joint is called a beak osteophyte. This is an osteophyte that extends from the anterior aspect of the condylar head and thus makes the condylar head look like the head of a bird with its beak coming out. Um, and you can pick a variety of different fowl to associate with different shapes of these beak osteophytes. You can get lateral and medial osteophytes as well, but the beak osteophyte is by far the most common.
Here's another example of a beak osteophyte. I think this one looks a little more like an eagle to me. But what I wanted to show in this image is actually what happens in late stage disease when the glenoid fossa no longer has its nice smooth cup-like contour and begins to remodel in response to the change in the shape of the condylar head. This is a very late finding and indicative of severe degenerative disease whenever you start to see glenoid remodeling. Here's another example of a beak osteophyte and glenoid remodeling as seen on sagittal CT. You can see that instead of a nice rounded cup, the glenoid now has this very flat appearance as though it's taken off the back of the articular eminence there and a sharp beak osteophyte off the front of the condylar head. T2-weighted images are the right place to look for joint effusions. They can appear anywhere around the synovial cavity. They often extend forward past the tip of the articular eminence, as in this case, they sometimes are posterior. Um, usually there's some component between the glenoid fossa and the condylar head. Uh, remember that up to one cc of fluid is normal within the joint, but really if you can appreciate uh, any substantial fluid there, that's probably abnormal. Another thing that we're looking for on T2-weighted images is condylar edema. Notice how bright the condylar neck is here. That's edema and it indicates ongoing damage to the condylar head, usually from bone-on-bone -bone contact between the, uh, between the glenoid fossa and the condylar head. Sometimes sclerosis of the head itself may mask the underlying edema, as in this case. I know there's edema all up in here, but there's so much sclerosis you can't even see it. Uh, when you see edema heading down into the neck, that's a good indicator that it goes all the way through that, that uh, condylar head and neck. When we are looking at the intraarticular disc, T1 weighted images are the way to do it. And what you're looking for here are bright lines through the otherwise very dark disc. So here is the disc itself and these horizontally oriented lines are fissures, tears within the disc itself. It's very difficult to distinguish between a simple fissure and a true tear radiologically, but we want to be able to indicate severity of degenerative disease affecting the disc itself and the disc losing its normal morphology. Dislocation of the intraarticular disc is one of the most important things that we're looking for when we examine the temporomandibular joints. This is often underlying symptomatic patients. Here is the articular disc in the closed mouth position. Notice that it does not extend back to cushion the condylar head from the glenoid fossa. It's entirely displaced anteriorly. That is disc dislocation. But there's two different ways that disc dislocation can roll out once we open our jaw. Either the disc can remain anterior to the condylar head, as in this situation here, here's the dark disc remaining anterior to the condylar head, or the condyle can recapture the disc. So here's an example without recapture where the disc remains anterior to the condylar head. It's not in its nice position right in between the articular eminence and the condylar head. Here's a situation where the patient starts with a dislocated disc entirely anterior to the condyle in the closed mouth position, but by the time we get to the open mouth position, that disc has clicked back into place and is now cushioning the articular, um, uh, the, the articular eminence from the condylar head. So this is a disc dislocation with recapture, and that actually makes an audible click that patients can appreciate. How do you define a dislocation in a joint that is supposed to open and close? I think one of the most important things you're looking for here is when the condylar head is completely anterior to the articular eminence. Some people can open their mouth so wide that it gets almost to this position and still close it again, but once you are this far forward, you need to suggest 
that there is a dislocation of the joint. Another important feature is that when the condylar head is this far forward, in a normal person, that means their, their, their mouth is wide open. If the teeth are touching one another and the condylar head is way out here or even onto the articular eminence, that's a dislocation. So the apposition of the teeth needs to be observed in combination with the relationship of the TMJ to determine whether there is truly a dislocation or not. Here you can see the condylar head jumped entirely anterior to the glenoid fossa there. This should be in the glenoid fossa. And this should be in the glenoid fossa in a closed mouth patient. What about subluxation? How far does it need to be forward to be subluxed? Well, here's a situation where you can see the condylar head in the glenoid fossa on the right, but on the left, the glenoid fossa is empty. Now that's okay if the patient is opening their mouth, right? We expect that to happen. But if the patient is closed mouth, then you can see this condylar head is anteriorly displaced. Not entirely, it isn't jumped entirely in front of the articular eminence. It's just too far forward for someone whose mouth is closed, whose teeth are touching one another. It's often easier to appreciate in the uh, in a sagittal reformatted images where the condylar head is no longer seated nicely in the glenoid fossa. We can appreciate this on Panorex films. Uh, if you haven't seen the entire lecture on Panorex films, it's, it's worth doing so to understand this image. Here is the condylar head sitting nicely in the glenoid fossa, right in its socket, right where it belongs. Here's the glenoid fossa on the other side, the condylar head outside the glenoid fossa, past the articular eminence, dislocated. When we fracture the condylar neck, it frequently takes the form of a fracture dislocation because the lateral pterygoid muscle is now the only muscle acting upon this fragment and it is the muscle that drags things inferiorly, drags things down, and so it pulls the fragment of condylar head and neck out of the glenoid fossa. So when you fracture through the condylar neck, it is frequently in the form of a fracture dislocation. This concludes part one of the lecture of imaging of the temporal mandibular joint.